via Zoom, you'll be able to hear and see, and we'll be able to hear and see you. There's two avatars, John and Dolores, that are already pre-programmed to do some stuff that I want in this scenario. We can do just about anything that you want us to do. So this guy already has two IVs in, so you don't have to ask for those, but I can give a bolus. I have some big 60cc syringes on that tray. The guy is able to breathe, obviously. His vital signs are able to change. His skin tone and color can change, so you have to pay attention to that as well. And he can pretty much do a lot more than a regular plastic mannequin. Hey, Dr. Kong, I'm Nick Slayman. I'm one of the interns. Uh, I'm glad you're here. This guy is um, coding and we need your help down here in the ER on his feet. And the dad said he slipped and he fell off the roof onto some garbage cans. Let's, how long have we been doing CPR? So this is about two minutes. We're ready for a pulse check if, if you want to pause compressions, John. Yeah, let's do that. All right, I'm feeling at the femoral. I don't feel any pulses. Okay, and he's not breathing, not responsive. Uh, let's resume CPR. Yeah, let's get a dose of epi ready. An epi, and I have a flush. He's like adult sized. I think we could just do like 0.5 milligrams of epi. Okay, let's plug that IV. Pushing epi. All right, can we get like an oral airway in on him? Um, yeah, yeah. I'm going to step up and put that in for Dolores. Here's his oral airway. All right, tongue seems to be out of the way. She's going to resume bagging. Um, and let's get uh, intubation materials ready as well. Um, you said you already sent off labs. You said you sent off the CBC and CMP. Um, she's, she's kind of adult size, so let's get a 6 out cough DT tube and a. Um, and Mac four. Okay. Yeah. Let's, let's look at my results. So it's definitely acidotic, metabolic acidosis primarily, uh, with a little bit of respiratory component. Uh, yeah. Let's get um, sodium bicarb ready too. Um, the EP seems unresponsive. I'm not going to give him anything to intubate unless you want me to. No, just go for it. Yeah. Let's do another dose of epi and resume compressions. All right. Epi. Uh, I think there might be an a pneumo on the x-ray like maybe a right side attention pneumo the, yeah the, right let's get ready to do a needle decompression on the right side okay i have a long firming needle here where do i put it so go mid clavicular in like the second or third interspace what side on the right side right right okay yeah sure right right side all right so you said mid clavicular where uh second or third interspace and what do I do? Just jam in there? Um, yeah, yeah, just uh, straight down. Um, what size? What size needle you have? Uh, it says eighteen gauge. Okay, that's good. Um, is it attached to a syringe? There's like air leaking out. Okay, that's good. Um, uh, I feel like his color is getting a little bit better. Okay. Uh, can you listen to his chest to see if you hear breath sounds on both sides? Yeah, let me listen. He looks a lot pinker. Okay, let's do a pulse check as well. Uh, yeah, pulse CPR and his pulse. Yeah, he's got a pulse. He's got a sat. Okay, that's good. <laughs> All right, let's pause there. And I'll take the headset off and we'll discuss. All right, Steve, good job. So tell me what your thoughts were tell me what you were thinking and john if you can hear me can we pull the um the graphic from behind the blood gas up to the front well so first i wanted like a brief history so you know from a 17 year old with a with a trauma um and how do you identify who's going to give you that history because there is a risk that you say what's going on here and you get 20 different people giving you bits and pieces, some of which may or may not be accurate. So how are you gonna sort through that as the first thing in a mock code or a real code? So if, yeah, if I had a code where there were multiple people and I wasn't sure who was doing what, I would, um, well, I would first introduce myself and then I would ask who's in charge and it sounded like he was in PEA. So I went down that pathway. 
Now, originally you wanted pads because you wanted to defibrillate him. Why did you want that? Why did you go that direction first? I didn't necessarily want to defibrillate. I just, um, I think just sort of, I, I, I think it's a good habit to just have the Zoll pads on. Yep. Uh, and there's multiple benefits to those Zoll besides the ability to defibrillate, um, also for rhythm analysis. Mm -hmm. But that's something that you need to ask your team. How effective do you think those compressions are? Can you feel pulses with compressions? And I think you did a good job of keeping track of a time in your head of how many minutes have gone by since the last round of CPR? When's our next two minute pulse check? When's our next epi ready to go? So the pH is 6.97, obviously very acidotic. Um, the PCO2 is 55. Um, yeah. Why does it not have to be Because he has compression on his uh, uh, or vessels uh, leading back to the heart that he yep. has no cardiac. Output. Good. So he has a massive right-sided pneumothorax. You can see his heart is pushed over to the left side. You can see his heart is skinny. His SVC and his IVC are being compressed. So his right heart is essentially empty. And empty hearts set themselves up for PEA and H systole. Mm -hmm. And that's where a lot of the H's and T's direct you. Hypovolemia, tamponade, tension pneumo, thrombosis being a pulmonary embolus and the heart is empty. You have to work together on closed loop. So I want 0.1 cc's per kilo of the one to 10,000 epi. Is that what you have? Hold up the syringe. Yep, that's the one because these syringes are even labeled. Mm -hmm. so you zoom in really close, you can see the syringe and what's you know stamped on the side of it. So I had ketamine, I had three doses of epi, and I had rocuronium drawn up in addition to the flushes and the saline. But okay, epi's in. Can you confirm that you pushed that? Yep, gave it. Did you flush it? Yep, I flushed it. Circulating for two more minutes. We'll stop for a rhythm check. So it's a little bit of a new skill to be the remote code leader, but I think it offers a benefit that you can't jump in there. So if you were in the PICU and we had a dummy there and I really was struggling with getting the breathing tube in, I think a lot of our fellows would be like, all right, let me in there. I'm going to put the breathing tube in. And now you're no longer the code leader. Mm -hmm. or those CPR, that CPR is ineffective. You're not doing it right. Let me show you how to do it. And you could jump in there or we can't get the IV in. Well, then as the code leader, skip the IV, put the IO in. But there's an urge to say, oh, well, I'm the critical care fellow. I can do all those skills. I'll do them. And once you start taking over individual parts of the code, you're not the code leader. Okay. Any kind of feedback that you guys think, this is good, this is bad. We need this. We don't need that. You know, if this were a code, I, I should say like X or, you know, like, like, as you pointed out, the closed loop um, communication, because obviously we want to all work together as effectively as possible. So I think, you know, whether or not, like if Steve's in charge, like telling him, like, let's go through our H's and T's, like given this history, it's like most likely attention pneumo. Let's make sure we get that X-ray and have all our tools to move forward with that, you know, give volume, as you said. So you know, I don't, I, you don't have to take over, but you can certainly communicate with closed loop communication um, to the leader. You just don't want to distract them while they. Yep, that's exactly right. So I think PALS kind of tries to teach and hammer into you. We don't want to distract the code leader, but being able to quietly suggest. So yeah, all things that kind of the catechist is experimenting with um, and, you know, playing with that control panel, adding things that the controller of the mock code can do and not do. So he can sit up, he can move his head, he can open his eyes and kind of cross his arms like he doesn't want you to do something. Um, we can put a mask on him for COVID. We can have him in a bed, out of a bed, with a blanket, without a blanket. That's awesome. Kind of I just think that the um, this format really forces you to um, you know, really be skillful with your communication. And I think that is so important in the success of a code. And I think even senior intensivists walk into codes and part of it is we want to do things because we know we can intubate and we're doers. Yep. And so just you're so effective as a leader or as a member of the team when you're really, really clear with your instructions and your communication. And I think this 
really forces you to do that. Uh, Mindy, what you said also reminds me of that exercise from boot camp that we did where you, like, the, the code leader is blindfolded and then, you know, you have to rely on communication to get, a, get through it. It has that element with this remoteness that you have to really rely on your communication because you can't be there, or step in and do things, like, you know, directly, but also you can't see as well as you would in a normal circumstance an S bar or a quick recap every so often um, because people will be coming in and out of the room, but people's understandings and, and level of like getting up to speed of where they're at or should be are going to be different as well. So I think that that becomes a very important role that is going to be especially well utilized in this platform. I really like this. I think we should keep doing this. I agree.